I now invite Dr Alexander to continue the case for the proposition. So, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this House believes that science alone can never answer our biggest questions. I maybe should start by saying that ever since reading uh, biochemistry here uh, just a few years ago, back in the mid-1960s, uh, I have spent my life in biological research, uh, particularly engaged in immunology and cancer research, and I'm passionate about science. I agree with the previous speaker that science answers many of our great questions, and I'm passionate about the application of science to society. And in particular, I am a passionate Darwinian. I believe that science really does provide uh, the only really rational approach to answering some of the greatest challenges that we currently face as humankind and which we've just been hearing about. I also, by the way, do believe in facts. I believe also in getting our facts right. So Copernicus was never in prison. Let's just be quite clear about that. Okay, so we're gonna have facts. Let's just make sure we get our facts straight. So why am I... <laughs> so given what I just said, why am I defending this motion here this evening? Well, I think the, obvious, the answer obviously depends upon what we mean by science and also obviously what we mean by the biggest questions. In this university, during its earlier centuries, as in all other universities of that period, theology, as you'll know, was famously referred to as the queen of the sciences. The classics, theology, philosophy, what we now call science, were integrated all together into the Latin scientia, this great one body of learning. Around the year uh, 1650, Bishop John Wilkins was then warden of Wadham College. He was organizing the Oxford Philosophical Club, which later developed into the Royal Society. And had we been having this debate in the year 1650, let's say, as part of the Oxford Philosophical Club, then I would not be defending this motion here this evening for the simple reason that science, scientia at that time, had such a broad meaning, including theology, that did it has surely had the potential at least of answering life's biggest questions. And it wasn't really until the 19th century that the various scientific disciplines began to emerge with separate specialized labels such as physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth. And it was in 1834 that the master of Trinity College in my university, the other place, the Reverend William Huell, invented the word scientist. Most scientists probably don't realize that the name of their profession was invented by a 19th century Anglican cleric. But it wasn't really until the final decades of the 19th century that natural philosophers started calling themselves scientists. And as the historian Peter Harrison points out, in 1800, the term natural philosophy was still dominant in English books, but by 1900, it had very largely been replaced by the phrase natural sciences. And science then became more professionalized as it began to generate increasingly specialized bodies of constructed knowledge, a process which, of course, continues right up to the present day. So now science in English is generally taken to refer to the natural sciences. If you come to Oxford, and somebody asks you for the direction for a science department, that's probably where you're going to direct, to direct them towards. I think it's also worth remembering that the situation uh, remains different in other languages. For example, Wissenschaft is the German word for science, but its meaning is much broader generally than the word science in the English language. It really refers to any kind of body of constructed academic knowledge, be it in the sciences or in the humanities. And this is the case when we look at um, la science in French, or uh, ciencia in, uh, in Spanish, or elim if you speak Arabic, and so forth, as these words all refer to much more sort of scholarly body of academic knowledge. But here we are, in English, in the year 2018. So it's, I take it that the motion I'm defending this evening is referring to the natural experimental sciences, what you publish in scientific journals, and their wonderful ability to answer some, some really big questions as we've just been thinking. But what about the biggest questions? Well, of course it depends what you actually believe the biggest questions might be. So I just want to take a few examples uh, of things that I think are pretty obvious. Um, science doesn't have the answer to, however complete science is going to become, uh, but I think are things worth thinking about. For example, let's say that someone's biggest question is who they want their life partner to be. Now, I'm all personally for doing some pretty thorough research before making up your mind about that kind of question. 
But the fact of the matter is that however complete your scientific analysis of your beloved might be, including a complete description of their genetics, their biochemistry, their physiology, brain scanning, anything else you want really, <laughs> that knowledge, that knowledge probably isn't going to change your love for them, which isn't one hopes, based on detailed scientific analysis to start with. In other words, as we enter into existential, personal, loving relationships and commitments, these are experiences that lie beyond science. These experiences are simply not publishable in scientific journals. Obtaining different types of knowledge, I would suggest, is like fishing using different nets with different sized holes. And the realities involved in personal relationships will just not get caught as you go fishing with your scientific net. Now, what about someone who thinks that the biggest question in life right now is to address some major ethical issue? What about the current use of CRISPR-Cas, for example, a new gen genetic engineering technique to not only heal human embryos of a mutation that leads to genetic disease, but also enhance the embryo genetically in such a way that the future individual will be greatly improved over their fellow human beings, perhaps by being far more intelligent or with greater athletic prowess? Ought we to allow such enhancements? And will science ever give us an answer to that kind of big question? Well, clearly no, because science can certainly clarify the issues involved at the technical and safety level and so forth. But here we have a question that concerns human values, that concerns equality and how we ought to use new scientific discoveries. And ironically, the natural sciences themselves are simply not going to tell us what we ought to do in these circumstances. What about the big question, some would say the biggest question of all, as to whether life has some ultimate meaning? Now, you can be really old-fashioned and invoke the now dead philosophy of logical positivism to claim that the question has no meaning, but the reality is it's a question that most rational people do ask at some stage of their lives. This week we've seen the posthumous launch of the late Stephen Hawking's book, Brief Answers to Big Questions, in which Hawking writes, and I quote, try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist, close quote. So, why does something exist rather than nothing? Science is great at answering the how explanations, how do things come into being, how do they function once they exist? But if there is some ultimate meaning to existence, the big why question, that's a question that lies beyond science. As the astronomer and previous president of the Royal Society, Lord Martin Rees, comments, and I quote, the preeminent mystery is why anything exists at all. What breathes life into the equations and actualizes them in a real cosmos? Such questions lie beyond science. They are the province of philosophers and theologians, close quote. So there are many ways of knowing, which of course is why we have dozens of different departments in our universities. Each discipline has its own particular way of justifies its ways of knowing and its understanding of the world. Ethics, aesthetics, economics, history, law, theology, politics, philosophy, I mean the humanities in general simply lie beyond the kind of science we've been talking about and they provide incredibly value, valuable knowledge, which is complementary, most of the time, not rival to scientific knowledge. And so we need many approaches and many types of knowing as we investigate this complex world in which we live. And scientists, I would suggest, need plenty of wisdom and humility as they listen to the wisdom coming from other fields of inquiry. There's really nothing worse, and I say this as a scientist, for the public understanding of science than scientists who claim that science has all the answers. So, personally, I think it's pretty obvious that science alone can never answer our biggest questions, and I trust very much that you will support the motion here this evening. Thank you.